So if you can get find your slides um, for the industry analysis, that's what we're going to look at today. This would be module three, actually, we're doing module three. Module three. Yeah. Yeah, it was slightly out of sequence. Yeah. Well, it doesn't really matter because it's a stand, it's a standalone uh, topic in terms of linkage. And if you remember when I, when I first met you, we touched, we touched on a couple of items in module one. That you, that you'll see again in a moment. Okay, well, well, welcome to this module on industry analysis. And the idea on the industry analysis is to try and come up with a number, you know, tools and templates that will assist you if you're dealing, you know, in a situation where, where from a wealth manager perspective, you need to have a better understanding of the industry in which the client's business is operating. I know you're very, very good at, you know, the tourism industry. You know, you guys like know it inside out, but obviously there's other industries that you might well face. And when we have the video going as well, you'll see we've got some industry analysis uh, snapshots of different businesses that we could talk about, including pharmaceuticals. You know, you get a lot of American successful business people having operated uh, within the pharmaceutical sector, and therefore it's good to know the positioning of that. And like like a lot of industries, you know, industries are dynamic; they change; they don't stay the same. And pharmaceuticals is a really classic example of that. And airlines are another example of very much a changing and evolving industry. In the beginning with airlines, all airlines were highly regulated by the government, you know, in different countries. So you had a very restrictive structure in terms of competitive issues. But as time has gone by, the airline industry has become much more competitive as the regulations have changed. And you get airlines forming hubs. So, for example, in the UK, the British Airway, the main hub is at Heathrow Terminal 5. So there's a whole terminal at Heathrow devoted to British Airways only. And a bit closer to home for you, Atlanta, in Georgia, you probably know that's the hub for the airline for Delta. So what you've tend tended to find is that airlines will operate out of hubs and manage the flights out of these hubs to try and save costs. Pharmaceuticals, as I was mentioning, what's happened a lot there is the original patents to the drugs, they've expired. Most of the original patents were between 30 and 50 years. And as the patents expire, it becomes possible for companies to develop a drug, um, I shouldn't say a drug, a treatment would be a better expression, a treatment, you know, that, that, that uh, can be prescribed that would have the same medication as a branded name. So again, that's an example of an ind industry that's changing. So this will be the purpose of what we're talking about. So in the second line there, second slide, you should have, what we're trying to get out of this module, and it's not just today, of course, we're going to have the ability to utilize some of these different business models that we look at. Uh, we'll just revisit quickly the Pestle model which you mentioned in module one. Then there's a complicated diagram called strategic positioning and competitor evaluation. And that's very important from a business person's perspective because it strategically positions the business and looks at the competitive forces surrounding the business. Now, in aid, in aid to doing that, you can see the next bullet point is called this five forces diagram. And that would be the first video that we'll be looking at, where we'll see Michael Porter, who's professor, good morning, at Harvard Business School. He'll come on the screen, and if you 
Could you go a little bit nearer to the front, the lady who's just arrived, because then I'll be able to pick you up on the conversation. Okay. Thank you. See where the right microphone is. There's the microphone that's there. Oh, here. Okay. Well, we can come there. This way, okay. So, Professor Michael Porter, some of you may have heard of, he's a professor at the Harvard Business School in the US, and he's become world well famous um, through a diagram that he developed called uh, the Five Forces Diagram. And that's really, really useful in terms of industry analysis. You know, when you look at the larger business and what can be affected in this larger business. And he has uh, two very, very good textbooks. Uh, the first one features the diagram, um, you know, more or less throughout the book. Actually, I think I've got, yeah, I've got the book right here. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I've got the book on my shelf here. Yeah, this is, this is his book, um, Competitive Strategies. Can you see, can you see that on the screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you can see it's a pretty thick book, uh, but the core of the book is the diagram that we'll be talking about for the purpose of our industry analysis uh, section. And then, following on from that, he talks about products and pricing of products. And again, this is very useful, you know, for when you're in terms of the wealth management conversation, you'll see there's some different types of product positioning and product pricing, whether the business is going for a high volume of product sales at a very low cost, so that would be a low cost strategy where you're trying to achieve high volumes, or whether the business is going for very much a differentiated strategy where everything is about making this product you know, very different and therefore charging a much higher price. In total, there are three generic strategies that we will look at. Then the next one is a different professor, again from the US, called Anzoff. In his diagram, uh, we've used it uh, in NASA for quite a number of years now, and I think you'll probably find that one uh, useful to look at from your own company perspective, whoever you're working for. You'll see when we look at that diagram, you know, straight away you can think, oh, yes, I could actually use this at work as well. And then there's a very famous one from Boston Consulting Group, again from the US. Uh, Boston Consulting Group is still very active globally, and they have a very famous diagram, which you've probably seen before, where it talks about star performers and talks about problem charts and things like that. And then finally, we've got the case study, which is the US Corporation. And we started on that in uh, Module 1. Now, I, I'm trying to remember back to Module 1, seems quite a while ago. Did the guy print out certain pages for you on the Walmart Corporation? Can you remember that? Or not? Which one? Such a long time ago, you probably forgot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was meant to print out a selection of pages. We, we probably won't get to that point this morning, but when he comes back in, uh, I'll ask him about it. You can't see it there? No. No? Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll brief him on that when he comes, when he comes back in. So remember when we talked about uh, the corporation in module one, we talked about looking at external factors which have huge importance on each and every business, but they have much more significant importance on those larger businesses, you know, where a person could have derived their wealth from uh, in terms of a shareholding. I think if it's a stock market quoted company, or they could be getting significant dividend payments out, so we want to look at the background, the environment, look at the industry. I'm suggesting to you on this slide, some industries are more profitable than others and have the ability to produce superior returns, and again, we'll be looking at that. What's the company profile that you're looking at? And can we, you know, visit a range of ratios so we can see how the business is performing? You know, not a huge in-depth 
financial analysis, but sufficient to aid our conversation with the business people. Then we need to look at the cash flows, and again on the, on the U.S. corporation, we look at the cash flow to see if we feel, based on, say, the last three years' cash flows, that there's a sustainable cash flow driving this business forward in terms of investment possibilities and in terms of dividend payments. So the cash flow would be very important. And then finally, we look at the role and the competence of the management. Now, we looked at this diagram under Module 1 just briefly, talking about the process that we could use. And then we talked about this pestle diagram, using it as a framework when we were thinking in preparation for the interview, which would be very, very important to do some homework. You can kind of look at the political situation surrounding the location of the business that the person's coming to see you. What's the economic backdrop in terms of the business cycle? Where are we there? What about social aspects, technical issues that the corporation is facing? And you all will be aware of the, the, of the huge scandal that's just broken out in the last few weeks uh, over Facebook, the social media, yes? Yes. Have you been playing yes. uh, that in Masada? Yes. And the, and the country, the, yes, five million, well, I wouldn't say stolen, I would say misused. It's probably a better word because he's recording. Um, misused by Cambridge Analyticus, which is uh, a company located in the UK in the very famous city um, of Cambridge, where the very famous university is. So we have seven days in the UK of absolute turmoil. Uh, where um, the chief executive of Facebook wouldn't make um, a statement to the UK government parliament inquiry as to what's been going on, uh, with the result that uh, Cambridge Analytics, which is a huge uh, business in Cambridge, they closed. They closed a few days ago. They closed the business. Uh, so there's something, you know very serious that's got to be investigated because 75 million people's profile uh, you know, are, are, are on the records of the Cambridge Analytics. So technological issues really, really important today. Legal issues that can learn from that and environmental factors. Now this is the part of model that we're going to look at on the video. You see on the video and in the slides, it's set out much more clearly than this, so I'll move on from that. And if we fast forward on a few slides, then we'll... Yeah, yeah it's a new slide pack, quite a bit further out. Don't worry about that for the moment. You know, when we, when we see this as it is, it's set out more clearly. And that will link in with the video film. And I see my um, the voice coming back. Really? Yeah. Some, there's some pages you know, on Walmart. Yeah, Walmart. Can you yeah. ever remember printing those out? I don't know if it was a case study or something like that from Walmart, from the first class module. I from module one? Yeah. Yeah. Can you remember? Well, let me just fast forward right to the end slide, and you'll see the things that, you, that you're going to need. Yeah, can you see it on the screen there? US yeah. case study, Walmart and... So there's a non-financial summary, pages 6 to 9, and the financials summary is 35 to 39. All right, let me take a look. I can't I remember. Feeling, I have a feeling you put those out. Do you have these? The Bango Montreal? No. No, 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 no. Okay, we'll do a little better at the moment because we don't need it right now, but we got to get it sorted out to you, yeah. We, I mean, we, won't, we, won't, we won't get to that today, I don't think. Let's go back to just where we got it to. So yes, so there's the point of the diagram. Don't worry about it too much because we're going to look at this in depth in a few minutes. And we're going to talk generally to begin with about the business risk. 
just as we were doing in different parts of this wealth manager program, trying to strengthen your understanding of how the business is performing from a mathematical viewpoint, yeah, you know, what's in the sales are about, what's in the profits, etc., etc. When the conversation, as it will do, you know, flips into areas about business risk, we need to strengthen this, and again, this is the purpose of this module. So this slide here is the introduction to business risk. So what we're saying is in the assessment of business risk, we will inevitably, as part of our overall analysis, try to understand the company's competitive position, its strategy, and uh, its effect. Share 
we'll be looking at. And then in discussion, is the business that we're in discussion dependent on one or a few large customers or thousands of customers? Or, you know, hundreds of thousands of customers? Seasonality, you're used to in NASA, you know, is it a seasonal style of business? The business you're looking at, do they have export facilities? Do they have dependence on special contracts? That would be very important, the legal aspects. And then a very important issue is the market static, growing or declining in terms of volumes. What's the proportion of business on time to establish products? Or do we have some new products coming through? See the guy at the back there, is that the Walmart? Okay, thing, I, I have this from the Walmart Annual Report 2016, correct? Correct. I'm going to go back to the last slides and check with you. Right at the end of the slides for today, in this module, Miguel, yeah. we've got note for 2016, known financials are pages 6 to 9. Yeah, and then... Which, so that talks about the strategy? Yeah, but yes. Right. And then 35 to 39 should be a whole load of numbers. Consolidate okay. statements of income. That's it. Revenues, total revenues, so forth. Yeah, yeah. Right. And the cash flows? That's section of them. Yeah, cash flows is the last page. That's it, exactly. Brilliant. That's brilliant. So I have a chance to look at all these things that we're going to be talking about in terms of the business, yeah. business strategy, and how it comes through in the Walmart examples. So you'll have a chance you know, to look at world number one and see if we can figure out what's happening in terms of Walmart's cash flow and the linkage to the strategy. So okay, let's go back to where I got it to. So we're talking about the market. And the next subheading is the products. And again, we'll do more on this with the folder video film that you're going to see in a few minutes. What's the product mix? What's the product lives? Is it a business with very short lived electronic based uh, products, you know, like the iPhone, you know, or the iPhone, whatever number it is now? I kind of lost track. Uh, the iPhone 5 here. And what about the elasticity of demand, or is it very much uh, a standard demand for the product that we're looking at within the business? Then management, you know, management, we can't get away from this. What's the quality of management driving the business? And then what's the management structure? So the business that you're dealing with, does it appear to have a very autocratic management style? where the leaders tell everybody what to do, you know, and then everybody's got to do what they say, or is it more of a participative style of management? In Japan, for example, just recently we passed some new codes of corporate governance to try and make the Japanese businesses more participative instead of this very, very old-fashioned autocratic structure, which was successful in Japan. Japan was a powerhouse in the 1970s of business, but of course it's lost its way over the last decade through this management style uh, of behavior. Management succession, important again in terms of our wealth management program. Mr. Check, we have a question for you. Check, sure, of course. Uh, when you talk about management structure, are you yeah. um, assuming in this that we are talking about the board as well because um, I'm assuming that the board would be over this and would determine what kind of management you have in place. When you talk about the tone from the top, are we assuming that this includes the board as well? Oh well, yes, definitely. Well, if you look at this order, then it says management structure, uh, like a management desk, non-participating board. Okay. So the opposite of that would be a much more participating board of directors. Mm -hmm. So again, when we look at a case like Walmart, what we'd be looking for is we'd be looking you know, for a diagram, setting out the reporting structure in terms of corporate governance. Now, it might not be in the few pages that the guys printed out, uh, 
but, but, it, but if it's not, you know, I've got the report, he's got the full report, you know, we look for the management structure and the style um, in Walmart to help us on a particular case. Okay. Thank you. Because I think Walmart has recently um, bought shares in a, I think is it an Indian company or something like that, if I'm not mistaken? I want to say clip yes. or something like that. Yes, there is a press release uh, on this within the last two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they've actually bought the shares yet, mm -hmm. but there was a feature article um, that they were looking looking at this potential investment in India. Okay, so we're talking about business risk, we're talking about strategy a little bit, mm -hmm. and you have raised the point, why would Walmart want to buy shares in an Indian company? Where, where is the Indian company located? Well, they're in India, so I'm looking, I guess they want market share over there? Yes. Uh, what about India's population? Now, we know NASA, yes. what, 300, yes. 400,000 people? Mm -hmm. In the UK, we've got just under 60 million. Yeah. How many is that in India? Wow. Yeah. Well, it's almost 1,000 million. Mm -hmm. So, you know, China is 1.7, 1.8 billion people. Mm -hmm. India is now the second largest population in the whole world. So I guess, you know, that's what's on Walmart's mind, that they're targeting uh, this new geographical area for them to expand the business. So it'll be interesting to look and see if that features in those 2016 comments. It might not have featured at that stage, although there might have been a statement, you know, that they look to these different markets. Very good question. Thank you. So, and then uh, the other paper is that the first point about we'll look at this, looking at fixed assets, looking at the inventory, uh, which is a key area for Walmart and all that type of business, and then the data collection, that's the receivables, you know, we need to take a look at that. So the purpose of a case study like Walmart is to try and, you know, bring these things to light. So we'll have some of these general areas that we'll be featuring on and then we'll have case stories to, to get into. Now here's a summary checklist for you. On the business risk side, which some people call non-financial analysis. And can you see those headings there on this checklist? Yeah. Environmental variables on the left there. And this gets more and more important. I first did this checklist, gosh, must be over 20 years ago, as an aid to looking at the non-financial side. Then we're going to have industry characteristics, which again we will look at, linked to the porter, like the porter work. We have the business overview, which we'll look at in terms of Walmart. And then we'll have a SWOT analysis, putting out the strengths, weaknesses, strengths and opportunities. And that tends to pull together all of those things that are appearing on that chart. Now feel free with this chart to delete things that you don't think are appropriate, you know, within that sound, within your work, and add things on where you think there's extras that would be of good use to you. Okay, now, the next diagram we're going to look at, uh, some people find this very, very useful in terms of the homework that we're doing, and some people don't like it at all. Now, I still show it because I feel, I feel it's an important diagram, but you know, all of these things will be a choice for you at the end of the day. However, you might get a question on this in the exam, so you know, you do have it in the slide pack there, and you do need to understand a bit of what it's about. Now, this space is a positioning diagram. Now, if any of you have been for a job interview recently, you might have been subject to uh, psychometric testing, where they ask you a whole bunch of questions, and based on those questions, they profile you as a person. Anyone had experience in that? I think I have. Atlantis used to use something like that, I believe. Give me that again. I didn't catch it. Um, I think Atlantis, a long time ago, I don't know if they still do, they do something like that where you answer these, um, I want to say they profile you through a, like multiple choice questions or something. That's it, yeah. 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 
Yeah, no profile you. So, so if you think in the business context, that's what the space diagram will attempt to do. I say will attempt because it's obviously much, much more complicated than profiling an, an individual person. And even with the individual profiling, you know, sometimes they get it wrong because some people, when you're answering these multi choice questions, you know, you just kind of do it, you know, in a haphazard way, don't you? You know, you, you don't know how the profiling is going to come out. So with space, it's a similar thing. So if we look at the next slide, you see there's the diagram. Look, now it looks the first slide very complicated. And the four main axes, can you see that vertical axis on the screen there, running from low to high, or going from south to north, if you prefer. So that's the vertical axis. And can you see towards the top of the vertical axis, it talks about financial strength. And towards the bottom, it talks about environmental stability. Yes? Then can you see the axis that's horizontal running across again from low to high? On the low side, it talks about competitive advantage. And on the right-hand side, it talks about industry attractiveness. Now, if you want to, you can circle on that slide, put a circle around financial strength, put a circle around environmental stability, put a circle around industry attractiveness, and a circle around competitive advantage. Now, why I'm asking you to do that is because they are the four main areas that will help you understand the profiling using the space diagram. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to try and switch across a second. Right. Can you see on this piece of paper I've just done those four mm -hmm. yes. two axes? Yeah? Yes. Okay. That's good if you can see it because what I'd like you to do is take the blank paper or the back of one of those sheets you've got there and draw those two lines to start with. And then we'll do a space diagram in practice which should help you understand it better if we do it in this way than jumping straight onto the chart that you've got in your notes there. Okay, now, now the next thing to do is from that center point, make six equidistant points. So we're going from zero here up to plus six on this here. So try and do that. I'll do it on mine. And you must make these equidistant. Now, I haven't done it very well here, but uh, can you see it there? So it's running up to plus six. Good. And then on the right hand axis of your diagram there, you know, the one that runs across to industry attractiveness, you've got to do from zero to plus six again. <coughs> Using the same size of divisions. So again, I'm running from zero across to plus six. Now, when we go across the other way on horizontal, you're going to run from zero to minus six. So using the same subdivisions, same size of divisions, but this time running to minus six. And then the final part of your, of your space axis again runs from six, so from zero error to minus six coming down towards the bottom there. Everybody okay so far? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, good. Okay, now, now what I'm going to do is just, just jump forward and do one with you uh, that would be an example. Now, if, if I was looking at this axis here, and you can see on your side there, I asked you to circle 
financial strength, didn't they? Yeah. So what we're looking at on this axis going up there is financial strength. Now what you need to write up here is plus or minus 3 is average. So plus or minus 3 is average when you're using this diagram. So what happened is, I'm looking at this large company, you know, in preparation for a wealth management meeting, and I'm trying to figure out the positioning of the business strategically. So we're not talking about Walmart now, because if I said to you, what's Walmart's financial strength relative to its competitors on a scale of like zero to plus six, you'd probably say straight away, well, it's plus six. Because, you know, they're huge, the number one, so they have an immense financial strength. What you would be doing is trying to rate the financial strength of the client that you're going to be in discussion with relative to the competitors, yeah? So it's quite a tricky thing to do. But just for the purpose of getting us going, what I'm going to say is, on this particular example I'm creating right now, I'm going to suggest to you the financial strength is just average, relative to its competitors, so it would be plus three. So if you could put a little mark on plus three on your f financial strength column running upwards here. Now it doesn't matter which way you work around the diagram, but, but generally we, we go around uh, in, a, in a clockwise direction. So the next one, can you see that you circled was industry attractiveness? Now you'll get better at this when we've watched the Porter videos because the Porter videos incorporate this aspect of how attractive an industry is relative this time to other industries. So you could be sitting in NASA, for example, comparing tourism, you know, relative to manufacturing, relative to retailing, you know, relative to lots of different industries and coming up with a score on the industry that you're looking at in which this client is operating. Now just for the purpose of this simple exercise, what I want you to do is just make the assumption with me that it's an average industry that we're looking at. So it's three, so it's plus three. So I've got two threes at the moment. Now the next one to look at is the effect of the environmental factors. Now, can you see that's the axis running downwards, the environmental stability? And to help you with this rating, if you go back to this slide, which was three slides previous, can you see there's the list on our checklist of environmental variables? Yeah. So we'd have to say to ourselves, well, the business we're looking at What's the effect of movement in interest rates? Is it good or is it bad or mediocre? What's the effect of inflation, unemployment, wage controls, etc., 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 etc.? And we need to come up with a score. And again, we'll do more on this shortly. But for the purpose of this first one, we're going to make the assumption that the environmental factors effect is average at minus three. Dr. Now, Jack, let's get a question for you. Yeah. On this axis that we're talking about with the um, environmental Depends. stability. Yeah. Yeah. Would a minus six be a good? Would be better than a minus one? Because I'm trying to trying to figure out yeah. is minus six bad okay. or good? Minus six is very bad. Okay. okay. Because it's more negatives, isn't okay. it? Okay. All right. So, good. so right. you're just like positives. Yes. More positives we have is good news. Right. More negatives we have very bad news. So very good question. So if it was a minimal effect on the business we're looking at, it could be minus one or minus two. If it's average, it's minus three. If it's a big bad impact on the business you're looking at, it could be minus four, minus five, or extreme at minus six. Thank you for your question. So minus three there. And our final cross has got to go on the competitive advantage or Disadvantage. Now, this is really, really, really important because this is where we're talking about the product positioning. And again, we'll get more help on this when we watch the video. 
when it starts to talk about generic strategies for product positioning. But just for the moment, let's say to ourselves, well, because again it's a minus scale that we're looking at, so it's this one over here, minus scale running this way, just as you asked me, minus six would be very bad, so we'd be at a competitive disadvantage relative to our competitors. If we have very, very good products and competitive positioning, we could be minus one or minus two. And if we're in an average position, we're minus three. So just for the purpose of this first diagram, if you put it at minus three, an average position, we've triggered the four axes. Now all you have to do now is take a ruler or a straight edge and join those crosses together and you get a diagram. Now there's, there's my diagram shape. You see it? Now you should get it the same because it's plus three, minus three, plus three, and minus three. So you're going to get a perfectly symmetrical shape like a diamond shape. And if you're doing the business preparation for the interview and you get this type of shape, this is a warning signal. Because that business has no strategic thrust. Can you see it's just like hovering in the middle? So looking at your chart there, your slide again, can you see the final parts on the slide? We talk about aggressive positioning, can you see that? The top right quadrant? Yes. We talk about a competitive position in the bottom right. We talk about defensive. Bottom left, where our business is boxed in, it's in defensive positioning. And then top left, we talk about conservative. So the thrust of this business that we've just drawn, it's not aggressive, it's not competitive, it's not defensive, and it's not conservative. It's like going nowhere in terms of its strategy. So that's an initial use of the diagram. This diagram, we are showing no strategic thrust. Now, what I'd like to do is I'll stop talking for just five minutes or so. Think about the business that you work in. And have, a go, have another go at this diagram. Say to yourself, well, what's the financial strength of the business I work in, you know, relative to my competitors? And try and put a score on the scale. Think about the industry that you're in. Do you think it's accurate? Go 
seen for the last one, and then he had all glasses. <laughs> they stopped being two weeks, they would give me my glasses, and I go to the end.
Okay, we're done, Jackson. Yeah, we can have, they'll come through, yes. Um, yeah. Yes, we did. I mean, from the little that we could hear. Yeah. I have a question for you, though. I think we understood exactly um, what he was saying about the analysis of the pharmaceuticals. Um, for the um, industry, I, was, I couldn't hear as much of it. I don't know if you would mind just telling us because... Interestingly enough, when he looked at the, um, I guess, the forces of the industry, I mean, of the airline industry, I know a lot of those airlines that he had on that, um, on one of those billboards, it's certainly out of business now. They had like Eastern and Pan Am and that sort of stuff. So, I guess there are significant differences between the two industries, but we couldn't hear about the second one. Yeah, I'll yeah. give him a link. Yeah, so he can watch it. Yes. The industry for the pharmaceutical is perhaps. Dr. Chapley, can you hear us? Wait, wait, give me, give me one second. Give me one second. What's going on here? Yeah, that's the sweep of the sound. Mm -hmm. Maybe your pharmaceutical is okay to hear me. Okay. All right, we're good to go. Yeah. Okay, so you were saying that you didn't pick up some of the airline part. Um, the airline's very interesting because the airline sector's changed quite a lot you know, from the date you made that film, yeah? Right, and I noticed too, Miriam was saying that. Um yeah, that a lot of things have changed, but I think in the pharmaceutical industry, a lot of that um, information was still is still true today yeah. in terms yeah. of the patents. Yeah, and, um, yeah, the and that sort of yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, the yeah. 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 Operators, you know, where the objective is just to fill the plane. Yes. And if you have to come to uh, the UK or you're in Europe, you see EasyJet. You've heard of EasyJet? Yes, yes, I've heard of it. Yeah, well, they're very low cost. Uh, and they were started by um, a gentleman from Greece whose, whose grandfather was a shipping magnet. Mm -hmm. So his grandfather was very used to the concept of uh, shipping goods and trying to make the ship as full as possible of freight, yeah? Mm -hmm. So very much a volume, low-cost operator. So when Stelios uh, came to the UK, his grandfather gave him $50 million to start his own business. And everybody was very surprised because he went into the airline business. You know, we thought he'd go into shipping, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. But he, he decided he'd run the EasyJet airline on a similar basis to how his grandfather ran the shipping line. So he adopted a strategy that what he would do is charge the lowest possible seat price to get as many as possible people in the plane. And what he also did was to save costs of operation, he, he could uh, have all, all telephone contact, anything like that at all. It was all online straight away, yeah? So you can't speak to anybody. One thing you do to book your seat is you go on these like, websites, on your computer you select you know, the date you want to fly, where you want to fly to, and the whole process is automated by the computer. So there's two things you do, computer organization and uh, the strategy, and it's been very, very, very successful. And if you ever fly into Gatwick Airport in the UK, you'll see these jet planes um, who are everywhere, uh, yeah. so it's very successful business. Other people have copied, uh, Ryanair from Ireland, they've adopted a similar strategy. But the, the low-cost operators find it difficult to compete with EasyJet because 
you know, he was forced in with this type of strategy. So yeah, airlines moved on. So going back into the Porter's Fire Forces diagram that we were discussing, so looking at this again, you know, the positioning of the business that you are in discussion with are going to be in discussion. What you'd want to do is start with that business, you know, and put it in the center box. That's the best place to start, I think, from my experience. And I think you'd probably agree because that's the area where you tend to think about most of you tend to think about the rivalry about amongst people who are in in the industry and the existing people, yes? Is that fair comment? Yes. Yeah. Now the only thing we would do different to what he did on the film is on the films, you know, you could see him making ticks on the boxes uh, and stuff like that, but that's not good enough for us, you know, for this type of program. What we need to do is we need to get a bit more specific in terms of the grading. So if you make a note on that slide, uh, low, medium, high, and very high. So they're the four grading categories that I'd use when I'm looking at this diagram. So to begin with, I'd go for that center box and say to myself, well, what's the company that we're looking at? What's the rivalry amongst the existing competitors in this industry? Is it low? Is it medium? Is it high? Or is it very high? So that's how it starts the process. Then generally, the next box that lots of people think about is that box at the top, which is the threat of new entrants. So that's new people coming into the industry. Now, Porter mentioned in pharmaceuticals the barrier to entry, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. So what you, all, what you usually have in most industries, the only thing that will deter new people coming in to an industry, so what will affect the threat of new entrants will be that it is It's not it. And just quite against barrier to entry. Can you say yeah, that again, Dr. Barrier to entry. Yeah, sorry? Can you repeat that? I think you, we missed that. Um, when you talked about the threats of new entrants, you were saying some of the barriers. Is it is it like cost that you're talking about? Yeah. Not necessarily. Uh, when you looked at pharmaceuticals, what was the, what, what was the barrier to entry oh, for new people generic. coming into pharmaceutical generic. industry? Oh, there, was a pat there were patents yeah. that had not expired. Yeah, getting the patent, uh, the cost of coming in, Yes, because you have to have thousands yeah, of attempts before you, before you find a successful drug. Yes. Now what about airlines? What was the barrier to entry in airlines now that, originally? What was the barrier? That part I didn't hear. I, I mean, when I think about okay, it... Okay, the, the original barrier was regulation. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. But when the airlines became unregulated, the barrier changed basically to what you said cost, yeah? Yes. You know, to come into the airline industry, you know, you've got to have at least, at least one plane. Yeah. Uh, I smile on that because when I flew over Trinidad once, uh, the Trinidad Airline, you only had two planes. Wow. And one, one was in the service, it was being serviced in Canada, so the Trinidad Airline only had one plane. Mm -hmm. You know, one, inter, one international airplane. So the cost would be an effective barrier. Now what if I'm coming into Nassau to set up a bank? What would be, so I'm a new entrant, I'm going to try and come in, what would be the barrier to me coming in as an entrant? Um, Mary was saying um, regulations as well here. That's it, yeah. Regulations from the central bank, yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. so, that's, so that's two parts of the diagram. Now, the other part which is really, really interesting is if you go to the bottom box, what's the threat of substitute products or services? Now in the, in the um, pharmaceuticals, you saw a substitute product coming in, which was what he called a generic drug, yeah? Yes. This is copycat, it's a copycat drug. It has the same components, but it can't have the same brand name because the brand 
names other than but there's a substitute uh, what about a substitute to the airline industry is there one um i think it depends on where you are but let's say if you're a, let's say in europe you can take the train well you can take the train uh, or then, the Mediterranean, you could just take a ship, yeah? Yes. You, know, you, you could take a, um, a cruise airline, a cruise liner, like uh, what comes in the NASA there. But if, but if you've got to make a flight, you know, you've got to have a plane at the moment. Right. Yeah, there's no substitute really, as you say, if you're going to be flying internationally. Now, that I don't use it's the left and right. Now, left and right are... are if you think about the economics that you did at school or college or university or whatever, that's what left and right is. Left and right are the bargaining power of the suppliers on the left, and on the right is the bargaining power of the buyers. And this will change with different industries. Now, if we think about pharmaceuticals again, how would you score the bargaining power of suppliers? Would you score them as low? relative to the industry or major hmm. supplies goes back to brand and supply. Well, the question we have to think about it was who are the suppliers? And who are the suppliers for the industry? Well it's generally components, isn't it? Yes, yes. You know, so these so these components that go in, you know, to the industry that mixes the components to produce uh, within the industry the finished product, do you think these component suppliers have got a lot of bargaining power or just a small amount or a medium amount? Um, I think small. I think. You think small? Yeah, I'm thinking so. Because, yeah, I, yeah, because, because generally it's commodities, isn't it? Yeah, if I right? can't get it from one person, I'll go someplace else. That's okay, very good. So that would be low. Yeah. Uh, if you think of suppliers to the airline industry, and we think about the people who supply the engines yeah. for most of these aircraft, mm -hmm. like Boeing right. Airlines or Rolls Royce engines, uh -huh. do you think these suppliers have low bargaining power, medium, or high? I think they're very high. Mm -hmm. Because they're limited. Yeah, limited. But, uh, they are because they're very, very special. Oh, I the idea of it now. You, you know, you're figuring your way through it. Now, what about, what about the buyers? So, uh, buyers the pharmaceuticals. Buyers in the pharmaceutical yes. industry, I think, have very low um, bargaining power. Yeah, you, you've got no bargaining power they because if the doctor options. says to you, well, you've mm -hmm. got to have X, some sort of drug yeah. to treat you, mm -hmm. you've got no bargaining power because you've been told what you've got to take. And then you've got no bargaining power when you walk into the store to buy it because the drug is already priced, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so that would be low. Now, what about the bargaining power of buyers of, say, aircraft? Um, so these are the airlines. Their bargaining power is probably, well, probably a little better, but I think it's low yeah. still. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's quite low because the ticketing arrangements uh, you know, you don't have a lot of bargaining power. No. You know, you might be able to flip from airline to airline and use, you know, Compare, you Dr. Pan, or whatever, these different internet sites. But at the end of the day, you're not going to have much bargaining power. No. You, you'll have choice, but you won't have a great amount of bargaining power. So that's how this diagram works. And then what you come up with is if you use the scoring method I was talking about, you, you're going to have, like, badges on this, you know, low, medium, yeah. high, or very high, and the idea is following on from that, what you can try to focus on is where where these areas are scored high, that's going to affect the profitability of the industry, and where it's scored low, it's also going to affect the profitability of the industry, but in a different way. So what we're coming up with is, is a very strong strategic model to try and help us pinpoint you know, the likely outcomes of the business that we're looking at. So having said all of those things, before we look at other parts next week, let's just go back to the space diagram again, so that chart that we're looking at. So the purpose of the polar diagram that we've been looking at in watching on the film there 
is to try and help us get a better idea on that right hand axis, the attractiveness of the industry. We have to try and get a better scoring method on there. So you'd see in the beginning, if you two ladies were and myself, if in the beginning, many years ago, we had a pharmaceutical company and were operating in the pharmaceutical industry, based on what you saw on the phone, going back all those years, how would you score the pharmaceutical industry relative to other industries? Would you score it average, or better at four, five, or much better at six? What do you think? Um, I think it'll tend to what's the higher. Yeah, the higher end. Yeah, the higher end, yeah. because if we'd been into that industry all those years ago, yeah. Yeah, we probably would have had a patent right. for yeah. our drug, yeah? Yeah. Yes, yes. So we're going to be right on the scale there. We're going to be five or six, mm -hmm. and we're very attractive relative to other industries at, at that time. Now, the airline industry would have been similar. Yeah. At the time, it would have been high because it was protected, it was regulated. Yes. Yeah? So again, we've come up with a pretty high score. So that's how this thing, this thing works. So just for a few minutes, because you did ask me the question, are there any profilings of this? So we're just going to jump ahead slightly and then we'll come back to this next week. But if you look at the next slide, can you see on the next slide, here's some typical profiles. Mm -hmm. Now, I take a good chance when I show this because they really, you shouldn't really generalize about things. But, but we always get these questions, you know, going back years and years and years. So what I've tried to do is based on experience to try and give you some generalized opinions. So if you look at your space chart and you see if you diagram when you did it, if you came out in that top left hand corner, can you see in the top left hand corner was conservative, wasn't it? Yes. So you come up with that shape there. Mm -hmm. And you think about a conservative style business in your experience, you see there's probably little risk. Why? because there's little excitement, because basically, in a conservatively run business, the people running it, the board of directors that you asked me about before, they're probably very conservative in their approach, they're not going to take much risk, you know, the business is going to be going along, it's possibly quite a mature business, that has got quite a good market position, but there's little risk, little excitement, but there is a danger is a danger of obsolescence. Why? Because there are such conservative people, they won't want to change, will they? You know, they won't want to change mentality. So there is a danger of obsolescence, which would mean, looking at your space diagram, they could slip into the worst box, which is bottom left. That's a defensive box. If you're in the bottom left box, it's very difficult as we'll see, we'll come on to that in a moment. In the conservative business, there'll be little flow of banning. Why? Because tomorrow will be similar to today and yesterday. And generally, look, there's a comment about the board of directors. They're generally going to be old-fashioned people, yeah? Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to look for old-fashioned people, you probably need to look at the UK. And they're probably going to be British, British businessmen. And I'm not saying British ladies, yeah? British businessmen who have been doing the same thing for years and years and years in a very conservative way. Now, if we look at the top right-hand box, let's say your diagram comes out with a top right-hand thrust. That, that's the competitive, sorry, it's bottom, it's bottom right, isn't it? Bottom right is competitive. Yes. So bottom right competitive, you think about competitive businesses, such as the supermarket we were talking about, it's going to be subject to market forces because there's a lot of competition. <laughs> Pressure on the margins. Why? Because it's in a competitive positioning. On some of the products, they might have to take a loss to stay with the competition. Why? Because they need that product, you know, as part of their competitive strategy. And generally, under a competitive profiling, you're going to have high advertising and high promotional costs. Why? Because you've got to constantly, you know, bring your products and services to the attraction of the people out in the marketplace because it's... Con
competitive. So it's a very quick summary of the com competitive circuit. Now if you look at the other two, on the next slide, now the aggressive box, that's the most exciting to be in. But it's the most dangerous. Why? Because the business is very expansionistic, yeah? They'll be making mergers, making acquisitions, uh, entering new products, new territories. So therefore, all of these new activities will mean they'll have a heavy cash flow requirement. So these will be quite difficult businesses for you in terms of wealth management ideas because these people are on a bit of a rocket ride, you know, and, it, and it's going to be quite a volatile style of business. They're going to need very good management. Why? Because this business is more of a bit so fast. Because it's going to be moving so fast, they're going to need proper planning. And then they're going to need good controls. <coughs> if people are running this type of business, that'll be the last thing on their mind. Why? Because they want to expand. You know, so they're not very interested in controllers. But controllers have got to have a place within this business. Why? Because if things go wrong, say with a new product, or with a new market, or with a new acquisition. See, the bottom bullet point I put in, there's got to be an escape route. There's got to be a contingency plan. Because we don't want the successful business to be killed off by, you know, one extreme product or one extreme idea. So that aggressive section will be very difficult for you as well as managers if you get this type of approach. So you're much better, you know, with the conservative and with the competitive. Defensive you will get occasionally, but the problem with the defensive, the business is boxed in. It's got little chance to maneuver. And generally, their only hope is to rationalize the business or restructure. So that could mean, you know, disposals, laying off people in the business, uh, cutting back on activities, etc., etc. So again, not a particularly good section for you as potential work managers. So I know I've done that quite quickly, but we'll pick up on that again next week. So what I'd like to do between now and next week is just have another look at that space diagram and maybe try and figure it out yourself or if you want to take a deep breath start to have a look at one of uh, papers that you've got there on the strategy and start to think about the strategic positioning of Walmart. Okay, is that okay for everybody today? That's good. Yes, that's good. Excellent. Well done. So some of this will be quite new to you. Um, it's, it's a bit of a, a difficult area to begin with, but as it, as it progresses, I uh, hope you'll find the logic in it and how it fits and you know, what we'll be doing uh, within this program. So I'll see you again next week. Hope you have a good week and uh, see, you, see you then. Over and out for now. Thank okay. you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. So you all have done so far the um you did the corporate financial mm -hmm. literacy mm -hmm. and corporate whatever yeah. corporate governance. I'm looking to okay, that's okay. That yeah. wasn't really cool. I, I saw know. you on that one. You are very good. I guess what I have to go. I have to read the most of Yeah, there were good too. Yeah. 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 yeah, they were good too. Yeah, yeah, but. I don't think he was as effective as what he did it with you guys. Um, I think perhaps the group make a difference to the feedback. The right, questions. right, yeah. But I listened to okay. I got a lot more from last year. So it was just the lady who did all of the... Um, that was Mandy Morris. It's her, and then with him afterwards. Yes. And now mm -hmm. we just wanted this. Right. That's it. Right. And all of this is taped, right? All of this is so taped, and then, so you haven't really missed anything? No, because... Did you have the most sit on the Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what I do right now. Mm -hmm. I got this. Uh -huh. I feel like I'm a bag lady. All this stuff now I'm supposed to be reading. I got some stuff in the car. You do more classes? My husband's so put me in the house. I just got paper everywhere all the time. Every time I turn around, I'm reading something. That's a good thing. To it's only going to be... Because I haven't done it for a while. Mm -hmm. And so now that I'm here, my daughter is 
Plus me, you won't be able to do it. <laughs> so I figured I'm your husband. You will get put out. So I want to finish this this year. You're doing good. Thing is, no, no, this is the one straight through. Oh, the, I'm trying to make up. Okay. The good thing is, the stuff that he's talking about, I'm actually doing the course of now for that. So I'm hoping that it'll all come together for me. Yeah, because when I finish, when you see me walk around in 2019, just sucking my thumb, I mean, I finish and I can't think no more. So, no, you will have accomplished your goal. That's amazing. Yeah, you need to. I'm yeah. glad it's going to be me. And the good thing is, in the office, mm -hmm. what I like is. I'm getting a lot of opportunities to, to read. Oh, but not to read, but in terms of, oh, you know, opportunities in the office. office right. And so I figured I, I have yeah. to take advantage of this. Please do. Yeah, because it may not happen to it happen to everybody. And this will help not much money. I think with us, even I see it in our family, mm -hmm. it's like you only have enough for an office left for the most part. Yeah, it's waiting in the streets. Yes. Yeah, you've got to change with time. Yeah, so you will have been engaged and performing. You don't need the skills. So trust me, you're making a good yeah. sacrifice yeah. now. I forget 2018 is the year. Let me make a push. Uh huh. You'll be finished. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. And I'll be on something else. Perhaps so, a language. But I have a language. I mm -hmm. speak French. Oh, good. A little bit of Spanish. I uh -huh. did some Italian. That's awesome. the stuff I did in the, earlier. Yeah. I studied um, French in university. Um, I did Spanish when I came back, and uh -huh. I did Costa Rica for immersion, uh -huh. and I picked up some Italian, and I started German. And my German teacher died, and so I stopped that. Uh -huh. But yeah, I work in, I've worked in French, I've worked oh, in Spanish. Oh, that's good, that's good. Italian. Well, you're ready. Yeah, so we'll see how it goes. By the time I even catch myself, I'll be 65 and ready to retire. <laughs> all that information has been wasted. That's all right, that's all right. You wouldn't have gotten it. Yeah. Yeah.